dawn of the Industrial Revolution, Western society is primarily agricultural and commercial. The concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is 270 parts per million. And then, factories spring up across the countryside and industrial towns grow around them. We begin to burn fossil fuels in large quantities, and then burn more. The carbon dioxide level of the air rises. The level rises again, then again. The 1950s, the concentration of carbon dioxide in the air is 315 parts per million. Still more fossil fuels are burned. More and more carbon dioxide is emitted into the atmosphere. More industrialization, then more. More carbon dioxide, then more. The year 2085, the atmospheric level of carbon dioxide has doubled to 540 parts per million. What kind of world have we created? A better world, a more productive world. Plants are the basis for all productivity on Earth. They're the only organisms that can utilize the sun's energy and create matter, food. And they're going to do that much more effectively, much more efficiently. With a doubling of CO2, why cotton growers can look forward to yields that are 60% and more greater than what they are at uh, present day levels. For citrus, it would be a very, very positive thing. Our world will be a much better one. In terms of plant growth, it's, it's nothing but beneficial. We would expect a world in which crop plants would produce about 30 to 40 percent more than they currently are producing. A doubling of the CO2 content of the atmosphere will produce a tremendous greening of planet Earth. Carbon dioxide is the major building block of life. Plants extract it from the atmosphere during photosynthesis and transform it into the food we need to survive. As a byproduct of this process, oxygen is released. Throughout the history of life on Earth, there has generally been much more CO2 in the atmosphere than there is today. These higher levels of carbon dioxide encouraged life. Vegetation in prehistoric eras was lush and grew profusely over wide areas. As this vegetation died and decayed, much of its trapped carbon was transformed into the coal, oil, and natural gas the world depends on today. The carbon dioxide that was in the atmosphere is now being returned to it by the burning of fossil fuels, a natural byproduct of man's industrial evolution. And as more and more scientists are confirming, our world is deficient in carbon dioxide, and a doubling of atmospheric CO2 is very beneficial. We are investigating the effects of elevated levels of atmospheric carbon dioxide on plants using controlled environment chambers wherein we can control CO2 levels very precisely. We're interested in this because we want to know how C3 crop species such as rice and soybean may respond to future levels of atmospheric carbon dioxide. What we are finding is that uh, these species respond quite nicely to a doubling of carbon dioxide and give uh, increased yields up to 30 to 40 percent. Most of the temperate plants grown in the United States, uh, the temperate cool season cereals, soybean, peanut, uh, are plants that respond to carbon dioxide. The temperate plants will respond with about a 35 percent increase in growth and yield in response to a doubling of CO2. We've done a simulation of a doubling of CO2 effect on soybean dry matter accumulation and seed yield. And I have an example of that with this simulation. This shows the 330 part per million CO2 uh, dry matter. This shows a doubling of CO2 at 660 part per million. If I run another example here of just the seed weight, This shows the seed dry weight increase over time until final maturity for a normal 330 part per million CO2 
and a doubling of CO2, 660 part per million, showing about a 35 to 40 percent increase in seed yield. With our uh, work with soybeans, we have found that uh, soybean responds favorably to elevated CO2 concentration. Uh, the net benefit in grain yield is similar to that for what we're seeing for rice. Well, with rice, elevated CO2 levels stimulate growth and uh, ultimately this translates into increased grain yield. We're getting uh, typically anywhere from 30 to 40 percent increases in grain yield. Um, we get increased carbon uptake through photosynthesis. We get a decline in carbon loss uh, during nighttime respiration. Uh, we also get a decline in water total water use and all this translates into an increase in grain yield which is the useful portion of the plant um, with rice. We grew a wheat crop, two varieties of wheat, across the CO2 gradient from well below what it was in pre-industrial times up to what it is now. And we found that both of those varieties increased their yield by a factor of three. Earlier, we did a, an experiment with oats, and at the time we took the oats out, then we did measure the, the biomass, the total increase in stem and leaf weight and so on. And it, it was on the same order of, of increase as we found with the wheat. Elevated CO2 levels have greatly increased the growth of our cotton crops. We found that enriching the crop to about 550 parts per million, which is 200 parts per million above our control plots, that the growth has increased by about 40 percent or more. A world in which the CO2 concentration is doubled is one in which the plants will enjoy it a lot more. They have been, in, in effect, eating the CO2 out of the air for a long time, and they're rather starved for CO2. So the plants are really going to like this high CO2 world that we're, we're going into now. The increase in atmospheric CO2 is a benefit that uh, will occur around the globe regardless of where you're located. There'll always be some benefit for somebody, for everybody perhaps. Enriched levels of atmospheric carbon dioxide not only enhance plant growth, but they also make plants more water efficient. In fact, a doubling of CO2 would also double most plants' water use efficiency. Plants exposed to higher levels of CO2 do not open the stomates, or pores in the leaves, as widely as when there is less CO2 in the air, and the smaller the openings, the less water is lost by evaporation into the atmosphere. But what does this imply? The idea of increased water use efficiency for citrus is very, uh, very positive and it's uh, a good sign for areas such as Florida which are facing uh, severe reductions in the water use for agricultural purposes even at present. Well the marvelous thing about the increase in water use efficiency is that all plants experience it to some degree or another and most plants experience it to a significant degree. The research shows that when CO2 levels double from what they are to now, there'll be some large response. Our research shows that the 30% increase we've already experienced in CO2 has already had an effect on plants in this regard. Another question comes up is, what happens to the yield of the crop when it's water stressed and you have higher CO2? And an interesting thing happens. We find that, for the most part, it appears that there is a stimulation, a greater stimulation of growth under conditions of water stress at high CO2. So to some extent, the higher CO2 compensates somewhat for water stress. As CO2 rises in the atmosphere, we expect more crop production per unit land area and slightly decreased water use per unit land area. So we expect this to lead to overall production with less water requirements. In areas that are irrigated, we expect there to be maybe 40%, uh, at least 40% greater productivity per unit of water applied. And this could lead to uh, either greater areas being irrigated, but more likely to a very nice increase in crop yield with no further inputs into the agricultural system. As the uh, efficiency with which plants utilize water increases in the years ahead as the CO2 content rises, 
plants will obviously be able to grow and survive in areas where they currently cannot because of a lack of water. That means that you should see a tremendous uh, redistribution of plants on the face of the earth. In very general terms, you should see a real greening of the desert. You should see uh, grasses and, and, and small shrubs moving out onto areas where they could not live and survive and reproduce before. Then there should also be a tendency for bushes and shrubs to grow where only grasses have grown in the past. And of course, forests should greatly expand their ranges. This real-world evidence of CO2's positive effects has been challenged over the years by theoretical computer models. Some of these models say that the Earth is warming to a frightening degree due to the man-made greenhouse effect, a phenomenon in which CO2 plus harmful greenhouse gases trap the heat escaping into the atmosphere and send it back to Earth. The models say that this will cause the polar ice caps to melt, drought to grip the heartland of the U.S., and superstorms to ravage the planet. But are these models accurate? What role does CO2 play? Has there actually been any global warming? What are the computer simulations trying to do? What computer models are doing is they're trying to simulate the physics and the chemistry that is going on in our atmosphere. However, the, the chemistry and the physics are so complex that even if we knew all the processes that have a bearing on climate, it would be very hard to model it, to simulate it, with a set of physical or chemical equations. An easy way of describing their inability is to note that there are all sorts of things like cloud cover, water vapor, heat transport, that in present models have errors on the order of 50%. And such errors absolutely swamp the effects of a doubling of carbon dioxide. As long as the models have errors that can swamp the effect you're looking for, you cannot regard the models as credible. We don't even know all the processes, for instance, that are taking place between the biosphere of the Earth and the atmosphere. We do not know all the processes that are taking place between the oceans and the atmosphere, clouds and the atmosphere. The same models that, for instance, predict five degrees for a doubling are predicting we should have seen two degrees or at least one degree centigrade in the last century. Nobody claims we've seen anything more than about a half degree. Uh, the number often centers on something a little smaller than that. And that is overtly inconsistent with the models Moreover, there is virtually no one who believes that the half degree is due to greenhouse gases because climate has always varied by itself without man's intervention. So the reality falls about at least 50% short of what the models predict. And this is really one of the major issues. We simply don't, don't see at this point the warming the models predict. It's garbage in, garbage out. If you put in a bad parameterization, if you put in an adequate resolution, you do not have uh, credible answers coming out. Uh, it's not as though I would believe the models if they only gave me uh, that it would get colder. There's no basis for believing. We've gone from ice ages to warm periods. Uh, we had a little ice age until almost the 18th century. Uh, we're warming since then, but we're not as warm as it was in the medieval period when you had uh, grape growths in Scotland and, uh, you know, and so on. So the climate is always fluctuating and there is nothing in what we have seen in the last hundred years that looks any different from these fluctuations. Now, as we move into the late 1980s and early 1990s, Oceanic models have become much more sophisticated, and there have been several attempts by major modeling groups to uh, couple realistic oceans to atmospheric models. And uh, some of those models show that, indeed, the warming that people expect for coming decades is considerably less than what older models had expected. I probably share the puzzlement of a lot of